a reading from Second Chronicles chapter 14. Now, this is about the actions of King Asa of Judah, a descendant of David and Solomon and other kings. He also removed the shrines and incense altars from all of the cities of Judah so that the kingdom was at peace under him. When, he, when the land was at peace, he built fortified cities in Judah. There was no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. Let's build up these cities, Asa told Judah. We'll surround them with walls, towers, gates, and crossbars while the land is still ours because we sought the Lord our God and he sought us and surrounded us with rest. As a result, the people successfully completed their building projects. Asa had an army of 300,000 Judeans armed with body-sized shields and spears and another 280,000 from Benjamin armed with small shields and bows. All were brave warriors. Zerah, the Cushite, marched against him with an army of 1 million men and 300 chariots. When he got as far as Maresha, Asa marched against him, setting up for battle in a valley north of Maresha. Then Asa cried out to the Lord his God, Lord, only you can help the weak against the powerful. Help us, Lord our God, because we rely on you and we have marched against this multitude in your name. You are the Lord our God. Don't let a mere human stand against you. So the Lord struck the Cushites before Asa and Judah, and the Cushites fled. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're all in this together. Haven't we heard that a hundred times, hundreds of times in the last year with the pandemic, what we can do to stop the spread of the virus and protect ourselves and even more importantly, protect each other. Wearing masks, social distancing, getting a vaccine. You know, it's been rather ironic to be together in purpose We've had to keep apart in some senses, even by suspending our in-person services and relying on NCCP anywhere online for a time, then being just outdoors in our worship last summer. And of course, in our daily lives, school from home, working from home as we could, separate, but all in this together. We've made great strides even as now we face another challenge in the surge of the Delta variant. We've had to keep being faithful. We're all in this together. Well, welcome to NCCP Anywhere for the weekend of August the 22nd. I'm Dave Stawick and hello as always from our home on Capitol Hill. Now today's scripture that I just read was is the story of the relationship between God and King Asa of Judah. Now he's one of the um, lesser known kings of Judah and also God's relationship to the Judean people. It's a story altogether of great faithfulness. It's also a tale of terrific righteousness of God, of course, but also of Asa. And also, and this is an important part of this story, it's about the great intersection of their interests, at least as Asa saw them. Asa's interests on behalf of Judah, God's interests also on behalf of Judah and all of God's people. Both of the parties affirming and uplifting the other. It was a righteous relationship on Asa's part, not only because of his actions, but by his prayers. And that is significant for us today as we continue our series here at NCCP, CART 
before the horse, as we've been calling it all month and will for one more week next week. Our month series is all about our prayer lives, especially the various types of prayers that we make, the breadth, if you will, of our prayer lives. CART, of course, is an acronym for the varieties of prayer, C-A-R-T, contrition, adoration, request, and thanksgiving. And we've tried to make a couple of points in our series. First, all these types of prayer are necessary for a balanced prayer life. Just like a balanced human diet has many elements, fruits and vegetables and dairy and protein, etc. So a balanced prayer life that intertwines us most with God contains all those four cart elements. Another thing that we have tried to stress is that there are many ways of praying with our head bowed, maybe with our head raised, with our hands lifted or clasped, or just in a standard praying form. We may be kneeling. We may use fancy words in church with our liturgy, or simply speak to God as if we were talking to a friend. The point is that all of these ways of praying are pleasing to God if we do them faithfully and regularly. And of course, in our services this month, we have been trying to uh, include more prayer, in, including uh, making our joys and concerns more obviously prayers to God of thanksgiving or of petition, whatever. As I say, all of these ways are praying are pleasing to God. Just think of the Lord's Prayer. I was describing this to somebody the other day, and what we're doing here this month. The Lord's Prayer has really all of those cart elements to it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, adoration. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. I think of that as thanks for God's sovereignty that we might somehow be able to compare our lives here or form our lives here on earth to what God has planned for us in heaven. And for that, we give thanks. Forgive us our trespasses, contrition, deliver us from evil, request, and then thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Adoration on the back end as we had it in the front end. Susan and I discussed our prayer routines as I was getting ready for this service. She just returned from a, a week and a half in Iowa visiting her mother and some of her family members. And she asked me what I was going to be praying about the theme. And I told her uh, about this, uh, this idea of the cart formula. And she told me that her prayers are more structured and kind of like that formula. And I said that mine tend to be more ad hoc, reacting to things of the day and more conversational, like, oh, God, help those people trying to escape from Afghanistan this week. Father, be with the victims and all the rescuers in Haiti after the earthquake and, of course, the hurricane there. God, forgive us in this violent world, but I know you've got it under control. Well, all are good. God hears all our prayers. Let's just spread them far and wide. Now to the story of King Asa. To understand its breadth, we need to look just beyond the reading of today, that excerpt, and consider all of chapter 14. It's a great story of the power of prayer. And I'll try to give you a little bit of that background now. What made Asa special? Again, even though he's a king that you may never have heard of prior to today. What made Asa special? Well, to me, and my background as a Protestant Christian, he was one of the original reformers in the Church of God. 
even before Martin Luther, before Melanson, before Zwingli, before John Wesley and his reform effort in the Anglican Church, Asa discerned that things had gone wrong in the kingdom of Judah before he became king. They had come to worship idols under his great-grandfather Solomon. Actually, some of Solomon's wives were into that, and it was pretty widespread. Solomon was indulgent to his wives, and there were lots of, uh, 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 of little temples and, and, and uh, altars to a number of these, uh, of these idols that, of course, is such anathema to the idea of the Hebrew people of the one God, their uh, uh, monotheistic idea that set them so apart. Asa was not afraid to break with the practices and call them out. He ordered the shrines and the false idols to be removed. He knew that the one God was the most high and said, that this is the God that we shall worship. And in so doing, he was actually tacitly contrite for his people and even for his previous great grandmothers. Asa was saying to God in that, those acts of, uh, of his righteousness, Asa was saying to God, we're in this together. And we can identify with him as Protestant Reformation people. He paved a brave way. He gave our Christian reformers a good example, and he gave a good example to us as well. May the Holy Spirit always act through us in continually reforming the Church of Jesus Christ. Now we get to the part of chapter 14 that is our reading excerpt for today. Because of the people turning back to God that I just mentioned, they got rid of their idolatry, God gave them a long period of rest, about four decades worth, a time, in other words, in which they had no attacks from any neighboring countries. Now, that was a good thing on the surface, but as for us all, when we have a time of respite, the question is, what do we do with it? And in this case, maybe the people got it wrong. That's both Asa and his constituents, his people. We got to consider them together because we're all in this together, right? They used their time of peace at Asa's direction. They used their time of peace to build fortifications and walls and it occurs to me that this is a lesson that walls that separate us from others can sometimes ultimately be futile and destructive. The barriers, the otherness, the tribalism that we have seen hasn't served us very well in our current political time, has it? Pastor Melissa suggests that maybe it was more a time that should have been a Sabbath rest, a gift from God, uh, a, uh, as reminiscent of, of the seventh day. Not a time of idleness necessarily, but maybe a little bit more time for the cart before the horse for them. Thanksgiving for what they had, adoration of their mighty and protective one God, repentance for their sins, and yes, of course, their requests for what they needed. The request part came in soon enough. We are told in the reading that the Cushites threatened Judah. Now, that the Cushites is another name for Ethiopians. So they're coming from the south, presumably, in big numbers, very dangerous and threatening. So Asa got back into the mode of addressing God and saying, in effect, we're in this together. It wasn't clever or conniving. It was about communion with God. If you want to be alliterative with the seas today, communion with God, whom Asa knew was in ultimate control. Asa put his faith in the Lord. He prayed that it wasn't just about him or the Judeans, but it was about God's own reputation 
that was in, at stake in this uh, coming confrontation over the horizon. Asa prayed, and I repeat, and listen to the way he did it. Lord, only you can help the weak against the powerful. Help us, Lord, our God, because we rely on you and have marched against this army in your name. You are the Lord, our God. Don't let a mere human, or in this case, a million humans is an army. Don't let a mere human stand against you. It was as if Asa said, God, you've got skin in this game too. We're in this together. If you let the Ethiopians win, it won't just be defeating us, but defeating you. Clever, maybe, but a word of common interest and ultimately convincing to God. Because as it is written, so the Lord struck the Cushites before Asa and Judah and the Cushites fled. Asa's story is a confirmation, an affirmation, that if we come close to God, God will come close to us. And I reiterate our theme for the month, that one of the best ways that we can come close to God is to pray in a multitude of ways. Whatever time of day, whatever posture we take, whatever fancy or simple words we use, may we remember contrition, adoration, request, and thanksgiving. Confident that God will hear it all. God will hear it all. So let's conclude today with a cart prayer. Let's touch all the bases. Gracious God, thank you for your grace and your love and your son. Forgive us for our sins against you and against our brothers and sisters. Help all who are in need or hurting in any way today. And we proclaim that you are the most high God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To you be honor and glory forever and ever. And may all the saints of God anywhere joyfully say, Amen.